Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rovil. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is on atherosclerosis part 2. In the previous part of this series, we had defined atherosclerosis and talked about the risk factors and pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. In this video, we will finish our discussion by talking about the morphology, clinical consequences, and management of atherosclerosis. Okay, so a lot of topics, so let's begin. So we will start our discussion by talking about the morphology and especially about the morphology of fatty streaks and atherosclerotic plaques. Now, what do we mean by fatty streaks? In order to understand this, first we must know what do we mean by the word streak. Now, the literal meaning of streak is thin, elongated lines that are of different color or composition from the surrounding structure. In atherosclerosis, fatty streaks are denoting irregular yellow spots that are visible in the walls of the artery. The major component of these fatty streaks will be lipid-laden macrophages. So what will be the morphology of such fatty streaks under the microscope? So in order to discuss that, you can see that I have drawn a very simple diagrammatic image in the whiteboard. So let's talk about this diagram now. So we have already talked about these images in the previous video of this series. So here I will just summarize the components that we are seeing in this diagrammatic image. So this is the lining endothelium of the blood vessel. And in the early stages of atherosclerosis, just beneath the lining endothelium and in the tunica intima, we can see some lipid-laden macrophages. And like I said, they are also known as foam cells. So as you can see, this is one example of a foam cell. This is another foam cell. And here is another foam cell. And if you look closely, you can see that inside the foam cells, we can also see some lipids that are drawn here in yellow color. So these yellow spots inside the foam cell are denoting lipid. So these are the major components of the fatty streaks. And uh, besides these cells in a fatty streak, there will be also small amount of extracellular lipid and also small amount of extracellular matrix components like collagen, proteoglycans, etc. And in your textbook you will also see that fatty streaks may also contain some lymphoid cells as well. So what will be the fate of these fatty streaks? Many of the fatty streaks will evolve into atherosclerotic plaques However, you also have to remember that not all of the fatty streaks are destined to become such advanced atherosclerotic lesions. However, many will do. Now, the examiners are very fond of asking a question that is, can you see fatty streaks in individuals without risk factors? And the answer will be yes. As a matter of fact, fatty streaks are seen in the aortas of infant and they are also very common in virtually all adolescents. So now that we have talked about the morphology of fatty streaks, now we will move on and talk about the morphology of atherosclerotic plaques. Now atherosclerotic plaques are in fact fully developed atherosclerotic lesions. They are also known as atheromas or fibrofatty plaques. Now these 
plaques tend to occur in parts of the arteries that are exposed to turbulent blood flow. For example, at the branch points of arteries, at the ostia of exiting vessels, along the posterior wall of the aorta, all these are areas where such atherosclerotic plaques can develop. Abdominal aorta is the most extensively involved vessel regarding atherosclerotic plaque. So always remember that abdominal aorta is most commonly involved. Other common vessels will include in descending order the coronary arteries, the popliteal arteries, internal carotid arteries, vessels in the circle of willis, etc. So what will be the morphological appearance of an atherosclerotic plaque? Well, initially these plaques will be focal and sparsely distributed, raised lesions. However, with time they will gradually become larger and more widely distributed. Now these atherosclerotic plaques will impinge on the lumen of the affected artery. The color of these plaques will be white to yellow. However, if the plaque is ulcerated, as we will later see, that will result in exposure of the basement membrane and that will have thrombogenic effect. So there will be thrombus formation and when the atherosclerotic plaque is superimposed with thrombus, the color of the plaque will be red-brown. Now, these atherosclerotic plaques will be patchy and eccentric in nature. So as you can see in this image, the artery that is drawn on the left side is a normal artery. So this is the lumen of the artery and look at the artery on the right side of this diagram. So here we can see an atherosclerotic plaque, but also notice its location. It is eccentric in nature. In other words, it is not surrounding the entire lumen of the blood vessel. It is in fact eccentric in nature. And as we have said, it will also be patchy in distribution. The entire artery will not be affected. Part of the artery will be affected. And these atherosclerotic plaques will have a diameter between 0.3 cm and 1.5 cm. However, they can also coalesce together and sometimes form larger plaques as well. So these atherosclerotic plaques will have various types of components within them. So there will be some cellular components. They will include obviously the lipid laden macrophages, which are also called the foam cell. There will be also smooth muscle cell, certain lymphoid cells as well in the atherosclerotic plaque. So these are the cellular components of the atherosclerotic plaque. There will be also intra and extracellular lipid and extracellular matrix components like collagen, proteoglycans, etc. in the atherosclerotic plaque as well. And also there will be smooth muscle cells. So let's look at this diagram where we can see the various types of components inside the atherosclerotic plaque. So this entire region is the atherosclerotic plaque. Note that it has a superficial fibrous cap that is composed of spindle-shaped smooth muscle cells and I have drawn those spindle-shaped smooth muscle cells in red color. And also note that this superficial fibrous cap will also contain dense collagen that I have drawn here in blue color. Now beneath the superficial fibrous cap and also along the sides which are called shoulder 
these areas will be rich in cells so these are rich in different types of cell and they will obviously contain lipid laden macrophages so these are the lipid laden macrophages which are also called the foam cells there will be also some lymphoid cells for example you can see this one is the T lymphocyte we can know that this is the T lymphocyte by looking at the size of its nucleus and also by seeing that it has a very narrow rim of cytoplasm okay so this one is a T lymphocyte these are lipid laden macrophages and also note that here we are also seeing a lot of debris so deep to the superficial fibrous cap we have various types of cell and also some debris and these debris are made up of dead cells it can be degenerated form cells it will also contain fibrin organized thrombus plasma proteins and uh, extra cellular lipids in this region so all these things are making the atherosclerotic plaque now whenever we are talking about the morphology of atherosclerotic plaque we also have to talk about cholesterol clefts now what do we mean by cholesterol clefts the thing is cholesterol and cholesterol ester are the major lipid components of the atherosclerotic plaque they are present as crystalline aggregates and they are washed out during tissue processing so when we are looking at an atherosclerotic plaque under microscope we won't find the cholesterol we will find an empty cleft and that is known as cholesterol cleft so this is a very high yield topic for your examination the examiners are very fond of asking this question that what do you mean by cholesterol cleft so this is in short regarding the morphology of atherosclerotic plaque now before finishing the morphology i would also like to add one additional point recall that i had said that atherosclerotic plaques are also called atheroma or fibro fatty plaques but there is another term that is called fibrous plaque so what is the difference between fibro fatty plaques and fibrous plaques the thing is in most of the cases atherosclerotic plaques are lipid rich so they are called fibro fatty plaques however in some cases the atherosclerotic plaque may be composed exclusively of smooth muscle cells and fibrous tissue that type of atherosclerotic plaque is called fibrous plaque so always keep that thing in your mind so now that we have talked about the morphology of atherosclerosis now we will move on and talk about some clinically important pathological changes that happen in atherosclerotic lesions this is a very high yield topic for your examination so what are the changes that can happen to an atherosclerotic lesion there can be rupture or fissuring of the lesion ulceration or erosion of this lesion intra plaque hemorrhage atheroembolism and aneurysm formation all these pathological changes can happen to an atherosclerotic lesion so let's talk about these changes briefly the first one was rupturing or fissuring of the atherosclerotic lesion now you may be asking me dr rovul why will an atherosclerotic plaque rupture in order to understand that we have to know about the various types of plaque so some plaques will tend to rupture they are called vulnerable while other are more stable and they are called stable plaques so as you can see in the whiteboard 
we have drawn two types of plaque here. So let's talk about this image now. So in this image, we can see three arteries. The artery on the left hand side of this diagram is a normal artery. Notice that the lumen of this artery is normal and no atherosclerotic plaque is visible in this lumen. Now look what has happened to this artery. We can see a large atherosclerotic plaque in this artery and this atherosclerotic plaque is containing large amount of lipid that I have drawn here in yellow color. And if you look carefully, you will also see that the superficial fibrous cap, this part of this image is the superficial fibrous cap, and that one is very thin in this atherosclerotic plaque. And what are these things? These are denoting inflammatory cell. Obviously, the inflammatory cells won't be this large, but this is a very diagrammatic image, and I have drawn this in this manner so that you can remember about the inflammatory cells. So this type of plaque is prone to rupture and that's why this type of atherosclerotic plaque is called vulnerable plaque. Now look at this image. Here we can see another atherosclerotic plaque but in this case the amount of lipid is less when we are comparing this plaque with this one. And also note that the superficial fibrous cap is thicker and contains large amount of smooth muscle cells and dense collagen in this type of atherosclerotic plaque. And also you can see that here the inflammation is less when we are comparing this type of plaque with this plaque. So this was an example of stable plaque. So which type of plaque will be prone to rupture? Obviously the vulnerable plaque will be prone to rupture. And what will happen when the plaque ruptures? Rupture of the plaque will result in liberation of the contents of the atherosclerotic plaque into the blood. And those contents are highly thrombogenic so that will lead to thrombosis. Similarly when there is ulceration or erosion in the atherosclerotic plaque that will expose the basement membrane and that will also result in thrombosis. Another pathological change that can happen in atherosclerotic lesion was intraplaque hemorrhage. Now, this can happen when the superficial fibrous cap of the atherosclerotic plaque gets ruptured or when small blood vessels around the atherosclerotic plaque gets ruptured. In these cases, blood will begin to accumulate inside the atherosclerotic plaque. So there will be intraplaque hematoma. Now what will be the result of such intraplaque hematoma? It can expand the atherosclerotic plaque further or in some cases it can also induce plaque rupture as well. Another pathological change was atheroembolism. The thing is these atherosclerotic lesions can detach from their origin after getting ruptured and then they will go to distant sites forming microemboli. So that was another pathological change, atheroembolism. Now I have two separate videos on thrombosis and embolism. You can also look into those videos after finishing this video for more information regarding embolism and thrombosis. Another pathological change that can happen to atherosclerotic plaque was aneurysm formation. Now, what do we mean by aneurysm? Always remember, aneurysm can be defined as abnormal dilation of the blood vessel or heart. So here in atherosclerosis, the thing is, the atherosclerotic plaque will make the lumen of the affected artery narrow 
So that will increase the pressure in the affected part of the artery. At the same time, since the lumen is narrow, so less and less blood will flow through this affected artery and that will result in ischemic atrophy of the tunica media. Recall from my video on cellular adaptation, there we had seen that whenever there is reduction in the blood supply, that can lead to atrophy as well. So here there will be also atrophy of the tunica media or muscle layer of the affected artery. At the same time, there may be also loss of elastic tissue, particularly if there was inflammation that can lead to loss of elastic tissues as well. So all these things, increased pressure, atrophy of the tunica media or muscle layer, loss of elastic tissues, all these things will make the wall of the affected artery weakened and that may lead to dilation and aneurysm formation and sometimes the aneurysm may even rupture. So these were the major clinically important pathological changes that we can see in an atherosclerotic lesion. So now that we have talked about the pathological changes that can happen in atherosclerotic lesion, now we will move on and talk about the clinical consequences of atherosclerosis. Now always remember the major targets for atherosclerosis will include large elastic arteries like the aorta, iliac arteries, carotid arteries and also the large and medium sized muscular arteries like coronary arteries, popliteal arteries etc. So what will be the clinical consequences in these affected areas? In the aorta, it may result in aneurysm, thrombosis, and also it can lead to embolization to other organs from the aorta as well. So that's happening in the aorta as a consequence of atherosclerosis. What will be the consequences of atherosclerosis when the coronary arteries are involved? It may cause myocardial infarction which is also known as heart attack. In the brain, if the cerebral arteries are involved, it may lead to cerebral infarction or stroke. In the brain, it can also result in chronic ischemic brain damage as well. In the small intestine, atherosclerosis may lead to ischemic bowel disease and in the lower extremity it can result in gangrene and intermittent claudication. So this was in short about the clinical consequences of atherosclerosis. Now before talking about the last topic and that was the management of atherosclerosis, I would like to add one additional topic and talk about the features of atherosclerotic lesions particularly about atherosclerotic stenosis and acute plaque changes because the examiners are very fond of asking questions from these topics. Regarding atherosclerotic stenosis, always remember that during the early stages of stenosis, there is outward remodeling of the tunica media and as a result, the lumen or the size of the lumen is preserved. However, this outward remodeling has its limits and as the atherosclerotic plaque is gradually become larger and larger, that limit is crossed and that is when the atherosclerotic plaque will begin to impinge on the lumen and cause flow disturbance. In your textbook, you will see a term that is called critical stenosis. Critical stenosis is the stage of stenosis when the occlusion is so severe that that is resulting in ischemia of the tissue. For example, in coronary artery, 
critical stenosis will occur when there is 70% reduction in the cross-sectional area of the lumen of the coronary artery. For example, suppose this was a coronary artery and this was an atherosclerotic plaque on the coronary artery. Now, critical stenosis will happen here when that plaque is so enlarged that it is reducing the luminal cross-sectional area by 70%. Okay, so always remember that percentage for your multiple choice questions. Now, regarding acute plaque changes, we have already seen the acute plaque changes when we were discussing this image. So, they will include rupture or fissuring, erosion or ulcer, and also intra-plaque hemorrhage. And we had seen that these acute plaque changes can happen due to intrinsic or extrinsic factors. We have already talked about the intrinsic factors of plaque change when we were discussing about vulnerable plaque and stable plaque. So we won't discuss that here again, but we will talk about the extrinsic factors that are also involved in acute plaque change now. Now, elevated level of systemic blood pressure is a very important extrinsic factor that is associated with acute plaque changes. And in your textbook, you will see a very important information that in vast number of acute myocardial infarction, the onset usually occurs from 6 a.m. to noon in this particular time period. Now, why is this thing happening at this particular time period in vast majority of the cases? The answer lies in androgenic stimulation. Always remember, the level of androgen in our blood gets elevated when we are rising and uh, when we are waking up. And the thing is, elevated level of androgen can result in elevation of systemic blood pressure. It can also induce local vasospasm or local vasoconstriction. Now, all these things will result in increased physiological stress on the atherosclerotic plaque and that will make the plaque prone to rupture. So now that we have talked about the key features of atherosclerotic lesion, we are almost at the end of today's discussion and the last topic that we will discuss will be regarding the management of atherosclerosis. Management of atherosclerosis will include lifestyle modification, use of certain medicine, and in severe cases, surgery may be required as well. Now, regarding lifestyle modification, the physician will advise the patient to eat healthy, maintain ideal body weight, do sufficient exercise, and reduce stress. Regarding healthy eating, the patient should avoid taking foods that contain high amount of saturated fat and trans fatty acid. The patient should also avoid consuming a lot of red meat. The patient should also avoid foods that contain high amount of coconut oils, palm oils, and uh, also sweet beverages and foods that have high amount of sugar. On the contrary, foods that contain high amount of omega-3 fatty acid are recommended. For example, there are certain fishes that are high in this omega-3 fatty acid and those fishes should be consumed. For example, salmon, tuna, these fishes have high amount of omega-3 fatty acid and they are beneficial in atherosclerosis. The physician will also advise the patient to consume a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits. 
regarding ideal body weight the body mass index can help us in estimating our fat content in our body for example the normal range of body mass index or BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9 so when BMI is between this range that person is considered normal weight when the BMI is between 25 and 29.9 that person is considered overweight and when it is more than 30 that person is considered obese so the aim of the treatment or the aim of management should be to keep the BMI under 25 regarding exercise in your textbook you will see that at least 20 minutes of exercise is recommended three times every week and the more exercise the better because that will burn calorie and uh, reduce amount of fat that is depositing among the drugs that are used in management of atherosclerosis the most important is the statins and they act by inhibiting an enzyme that is called HMG coenzyme A reductase. This enzyme was involved in cholesterol synthesis and by inhibiting this enzyme, statins can reduce the amount of cholesterol and that is beneficial in the management of atherosclerosis. Certain antihypertensive drugs are also beneficial Especially notable is the role of angiotensin converting enzyme in management of atherosclerosis. So those drugs are also used. And often the physicians may prescribe other antihypertensive drugs as well based on the condition of the patient. In severe cases, surgery may also be required. For example, in coronary artery atherosclerosis, coronary artery angioplasty, coronary artery bypass grafting, etc. may be required. So this concludes today's video on atherosclerosis part 2. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. Okay, so that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.